Okay. Welcome, everyone, to the Energy Symposium this evening. Uh, next week's talk will be uh, Dana Harmon, who is the director of the Texas Energy Poverty Research Institute, and she will talk about her efforts at this Texas-based organization, which is a nonprofit focused on uh, energy poverty issues related to lower-income uh, families and lower-income households and uh, how to address the uh, payments as a high share of their income uh, that go to energy. So that's what energy poverty generally means, uh, those who spend a high percentage of their income on energy and whether this becomes a burden on other things that they would want to achieve in their lives. So she will discuss their efforts of that organization. Uh, today we have our own Richard Hukla from the Jackson School. He's the director of the Energy and Earth Resources Program, which was our multidisciplinary uh, resources studies program um, housed out of the Jackson Schools that leads to a master's degree that many of you are pursuing. Uh, today, uh, Richard is going to tell us what we don't know about the history of shale production, uh, oil and gas production, uh, I guess in the U.S. or worldwide. Uh, on his way to giving us this talk, he's come from Chile, where he was born, to his Polish parents uh, before he came to the United States for his uh, education from the high school through uh, a graduate level here at the University of Texas. Uh, he spent his career with ExxonMobil, and now he's going to tell us how his entirely colorful background uh, can tell us what we've missed about shale and why it's not a revolution. All Thank right. you, Richard. Thank you. Uh, can people hear me? Yes? Good. Okay. Um, well, I thought the title might provoke some discussion, and uh, I hope it does. And we're going to kind of elaborate on this theme about an evolution rather than a e revolution for shale. Uh, this is the only bit of advertising I have in my talk, but it is, it is designed to set up my talk. Because what we're going to do when we talk about shale is we're going to talk about sustainable solutions to energy and earth resources problem, earth resource problems, which I believe are inherently multidisciplinary. And so what we're going to do, these are the three concentrations within the energy and earth resources graduate program. We're going to talk about technology first, we're going to talk about policy next, and we're going to talk about finance at the very end. And I'll, I'll leave it up to you to decide whether shale is is uh, a sustainable solution to an energy problem. And you know, I, I think it is, but I think there's some distinct caveats that that, uh, that has. So this is the prevailing view. This is out of the FT and uh, oh, I think it was like 2015, I forget exactly when, the US shale revolution, how it changed the world and why nothing will ever be the same again. I mean, that's, that's a pretty bold statement about anything. And, and what I'm gonna tell you is I think it, it's a little different than that. So here's the revolutionary part. Um, we look at U.S. oil production, and you can see the 2005 prediction for where it would go beyond, beyond that point to the liquefied natural gas imports. You know, we're going to run out of gas, and you can see what the 2005 prediction was for natural gas imports and the outcome. And then you can look at net energy imports, uh, the outcome, and the prediction, and you can see that, that the outcome is radically different than the prediction. But... I think, and I'll, I'll pitch as a premise for this talk, I think what happens is people confuse the outcome with what produced the outcome. And what produced the outcome is, was absolutely not revolutionary. It's a process of very long protracted evolution. So a primer on shale. I'm going to do this for the non-geologists here, and I'll do it quickly. So what is shale gas? Well, in the subsurface, we have fine-grained rocks. And if those fine-grained rocks are deposited below a point where they can be oxidized in a, what's called an anoxic zone, they can preserve organic matter. And those shales, those organic rich shales then, as they're buried deeply, will produce oil first, and then gas as they're buried more deeply. So in this case, um, imagine a gas rich shale. It's one that's been buried deeply enough to mature the kerogen to oil first and then to gas. An important point, every single one of these uh, shales, gas shales, is oil prone. And the only reason that you have gas in it is that, that the oil in the shale has cracked to gas. Okay, conventionally what would happen is you'd have migration out of the shale through something like a porous sandstone. And then the next major role of the shale is the seal. And you trap an accumulation buoyantly. And the reason we call them buoyant accumulations is because the Groundwater is saturated, the, the subsurface is saturated with water, gas or oil are less dense than water, and they simply move up to an impermeable seal. And there we have a buoyant accumulation. 
can be oil, can be gas, depending on the maturity of the shale. What happens with shale gas is that there is a lot of gas or oil, again, depending on the maturity, that never leaves, that stays there. And what we produce when we drill into shale gas or shale oil is the oil or gas that has remained in the shale. Keep in mind, this is very, very impermeable rocks, and that becomes our greatest challenge, both impermeable and at relatively low porosity. Now, very quickly talk about the technology, and this spaghetti bowl of wells is from Svetlana Konikova and others study the, that's being done at the Bureau of Economic Geology, and this is just one look at the Arcoma Basin, the Fayetteville Shale, and you see all of these laterals which are completing horizontally within the shale. And then the other piece of it is that those laterals are fracked in multiple stages, and those fracks notionally create, induce the permeability that you need to flow gas into the wellbore and then up to the surface. And we're going to talk a good bit more about that. All right. The other piece of this primer is we're just going to talk a little bit about geology and geology of the Appalachian Basin because that's where this whole story starts. So this is a cross section, goes through Pennsylvania into central Ohio and goes essentially through the Appalachians into what's called the Foreland Basin, the basin ahead of the Appalachians. About 480 million years ago, Africa collided with North America and created this big mountain range called the Appalachians. Well, that load, that load, the, the squeezing and the formation of the mountains created a load on the crust and a depression in front of that load, and that's called the Foreland Basin. And essentially, that Foreland Basin traps the clastics that are being shed off the highlands, and you have coarse clastics near the highlands, and then fine-grained rocks as you get further away from the uh, deformation front. So I'm only going to point, I'll point out all these different black units. Those are all shales, all essentially middle Devonian to upper Devonian shales. And you can see the Marcellus in there, which is the granddaddy, not the granddaddy, it's the, I, I guess it's the gorilla of shale gas production now. It's the biggest shale gas producer. And I'll point out the Rhine Street and the Dunkirk shale up there because we'll refer to them very briefly. So um, we'll, we'll start this story with uh, La Salle in the 1600s. When he visited North America, he noticed these burning springs. And these burning springs were nothing more than gas being emitted naturally from these shales. And so that's something in the 1600s. This is the Rhine Street Shale. It's one of those shales I just pointed out. And there is a little pocket in, in this waterfall with uh, burning natural gas, which is being naturally emitted from the shale. So. Let's start at T0. T0 is 1825, and this is the first gas well drilled to produce natural gas. Um, drilling may be a little bit of an exaggeration. It was more like dug. I think it was it's something like 30 feet deep. And it was, done, it was drilled or dug near Fredonia, New York, right near the shore of Lake Erie. And the unit that it was producing from would be producing from was a Dunkirk shale. And so there is where the well is in Fredonia, New York, and the gas seeps up the creek were what uh, clued George Hart to, dr to drill or dig this well to actually produce shale gas. So this was real live shale gas production. It wasn't just like a little experiment. This is the Dunkirk shale. That's what it looks like in outcrop. It's this big, massive black unit, and it's organically enriched. And there's where the well was drilled, and <laughs> they initially used bamboo to pipe this gas over to an adjacent tavern, which where the gas was used for lighting. And that's what the first well looks like. There's kind of a big boulder with a, a brass plaque commemorating that today. The second and third shale gas wells and the first multi-stage frack were done, was done in 1857. So they used a cable tool rig, rig, kind of a, a a stretch to call it that, to drill down to about 130 feet. And they got gas production, but uh, they realized the gas production was declining very quickly. So um, Barnmore, Mr. Barnmore, had the idea to explosively fracture the rock. So he did it in two stages, initially at 122 feet near the bottom of the well, and then at 82 feet. And they used, just used gunpowder, lowered it into the hole, blew it up and fractured the rock. And indeed, volumes of production increased quite dramatically. So um, a little bit later, 1866, 
Civil War veteran Mr. Roberts develops the concept of using water in the wellbore. That helps contain the energy because otherwise a lot of the energy is going right up the wellbore and so the water helps contain the, the frack energy. So that's, that's basically through 1860s. All right. First metered use of natural gas and the first natural gas distributor was in Fredonia, New York. It was sold to the Fredonia Trinity Episcopal Church. By 1868, uh, shale gas was being used industrially on the shore of Lake Erie. And ironically, one of the users was this company which made oil well supplies for the then nascent oil industry. Uh, shale gas was used for lighting primarily. You all are probably aware that at this time, coal gas was really the main source of gas for lighting. It's really nasty stuff. And it was the predominant gas used for lighting even once shale gas came around. And shale gas ultimately became a, a source of thermal energy. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And I'll, now, um, you say, well, those are kind of one-offs. And that, that, that's not too impressive. But all of these little bits of progress were important one after another. And, and the next one of these that I can reference, so that I could go a little further back than this, was actual field development. So this is the Big Sandy Shale gas field in Kentucky. It is also a Devonian shale. It's in the southern part of the Appalachian Basin. Significant development started in 1915. Um, and by 1950, they produced over a trillion cubic feet of gas from this. This is not at all insignificant. That would be considered giant by today's standards. That was produced from 21,000 wells. So again, think about today. This is a very similar model to the development that is being done today. The wells, again, were explosively stimulated. Um, they were not hydraulically stimulated, although there were some small hydraulic fracks that were, were, were tried in the, in the mid-1960s. And really, here are the results of these explosive fracks. In Floyd County, there were a thousand wells that were shot. Uh, initial open flow before shot was 72,000 cubic feet per day. After the shot, it was 368,000 cubic feet per day. So these, these explosive fracks really worked. And then there is what I've identified as the first type curve. This is actually not production, but pressure. Same, same general story plotted on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. And you see something that looks like the hyperbolic decline hyperbolic exponential decline we see in these, in these shale gas systems today. Now, I've overlain on this the Barnett Shale, the outline of the producing area in the Barnett Shale. Uh, about 14,000 wells were drilled through 2010, and you can see that area it occupies, it's about twice the area of the Big Sandy Field. So the Big Sandy Field was not inconsequential, and it was bona fide shale gas development. Now, there's other things going on at this time, of course, that would ultimately impact the uses of gas. And one of them was the, dis the discovery of the light bulb, the patent for the incandescent light bulb in 1879. That was going to, going to push, essentially, coal gas and shale gas out of the lighting business. And then also new concepts for uh, combustion of natural gas, uh, which made gas a very obvious source of thermal energy and a fairly efficient source for thermal energy instead of just light. And so in, I put the invention of the Bunsen burner as just one example of this. So on the left, you see light from a, a nice bright yellow flame. On the right, you see a very hot flame that would be used for uh, thermal applications and power generation. OK. so. Let's talk about well, the, the concepts are there in many ways. Let's talk about building the technology foundation for shale gas and the first horizontal well, which, which was in 1929. But I want to preface that by saying that geologists recognized that once you drill a well into the subsurface, the, it is rare that the well stays perfectly vertical. It often wanders, and it often wanders to where it goes horizontal on its own, and it can actually turn around and come back up. And I've seen exactly that happen. Now, South African miners knew their wells were deviating because they would put little elongate vials in the drill string filled with hydrofluoric acid, and they would pull those up after about a half hour once it reached TD, and they would simply look at the etching on that little vial. It was essentially like a level, a bubble level, and they knew 
if, if, it, were, if it were vertical, the, the, the etching would be perpendicular to the long axis of the vial, but if it's not, that means the well's deviated. And we used to do that in the minerals industry very, very frequently. Would not give you azimuth, but it would give you the dip of the well. So 1891, first US patent for flexible shafts to rotate drill bits for dental applications, but even then people were recognizing additional applications that, and, and in fact the patent describes broader applications of the technology. 1929, the first oil field application, uh, they drilled, drilled a horizontal well. These are not in shales because nobody was drilling wells in shales at the time. And then really the 1980s, you'd ha you had the advent of improved downhole drilling motors. Uh, invention of downhole telemetry equipment, and a lot of this pioneering was done by Elf Aquitaine in the Aquitaine Basin in southern France, and then by BP at Prudhoe Bay. And today, uh, there is little question that the leader in this area as regards long extended reach wells is my own company, ExxonMobil, currently drilling horizontal wells with 15 kilometer reach at Sakhalin Island. So imagine that, a lateral that's 15 kilometers long. Now, hydraulic stimulation, part number two, right? So when we talked about the fracks before, we talked about explosive fracks. Hydraulic stimulation doesn't have to use water, but it uses a fluid that essentially under pressure breaks the rock. So this was the first hydraulic stimulation, 1947. It did not use water. It actually used napalm and sand, sand being the propent that keeps fractures open once it's injected. Um, and it stimulated flow within a limestone formation. This was in the, the giant uh, Hugoton field in Kansas. Then ha Halliburton picked up the patent. By 1953, water was being used as a hydraulic fracturing fluid, and by the 60s, there was widespread use in the United States. Interestingly, 1967, Operation Plowshare used nuclear explosives to frack wells in the San Juan Basin and in the Peons Basin. And it did a pretty good job of fracking the wells, but it also contaminated the natural gas with other radionuclides that people did not want. And in fact, the, the last of these projects that was never executed was called Project Wagon Wheel, which was a staged, multi-stage nuclear frack. And this was going to be done in the Peons Basin. I'd say the other milestone that we want to talk about here is 1998, which was the f first slick water frack application at Mitchell Energy in the Barnett Shale. And this is generally considered the opening, the commercial opening of the shale play, even though Mitchell had been working this since 1981. The slick water fracks were not invented by Mitchell Energy, contrary to a lot of mythology that's been developed. And, and it is kind of interesting to listen to some of the mythology I, during the the KBH uh, symposium about three weeks ago. I heard plenty of it from investment bankers and some other people. Now, we're talking to, we talked about technology. Let's talk about the policy context for the start of the modern era of shale gas, because this is critically important. So we move from technology to policy. 1930 to 1978, essentially there were price controls on transmission on wellhead price, and nobody wanted to go out and drill for gas. It, it simply wasn't a commodity that had enough value for people to pursue. So no power generator would ever want to build a power plant use, that used natural gas because they'd have no, no confidence in the supply. Uh, 1973, the Arab oil embargo, 1976 and 1977, there were some really severe natural gas shortages in the Midwest. And this caused the government to really look at this issue seriously. In 1976, they initiated something called the Eastern Gas Shales Project. There was a, another project called the Western Gas Sands Project. We're not going to talk about tight sands, but these are another very important source of gas in tight formations and a research group called the Gas Research Institute was formed. 1978, there was a, so we're gonna come back to that. We're gonna talk, come back to these shales, the Eastern Gas Shales Project. In 1978, the Natural Gas Policy Act um, imposed regulations for both intrastate and interstate transmission, had price ceilings on old gas, but phased out the price controls on new gas. So any new gas being discovered would not be subjected to the price controls. In 1978, the Federal Power Plant and Industrial Fuel Use Act 
really discouraged the use of natural gas for power generation. So what we saw develop from the 50s all the way through really the, the 80s certainly was coal as the main source of power generation. A lot of had to do with the policies that were being imposed by the US government and many of them which were predicated on the view that we just don't have a lot of gas. It's not a, re it's not a reliable enough fuel. In 1978, there was a windfall profits tax on oil. Price of oil had gone way up. And embedded in there was the one bone that was thrown out to the oil and gas industry, which was an important one, which was the sec Section 29 Alternative Fuel Production Credit for Natural Gas Produced from Tight Formations. And this was a substantial credit, and it, it helped some of these small companies get going in shale gas. And then in 1985, 1992, FERC uh, required full pipeline unbundling, and essentially you have an unregulated natural gas industry. So all of these, all of these uh, policies created circumstances that either uh, promoted or disincentivized, disincentivized the use of natural gas. And it wasn't until really relatively late that there was an incentive to produce this, try to produce this type gas. So the Eastern Gas Shales Project had as it objectives resource characterization, improved technology, and data transfer. They focused in the Appalachian Basin, Basin and the Michigan Basin. And one thing I should add too is that quite apart from the Devonian Shales and the Appalachian Basin, in the Michigan Basin, the Antrim Shale and a couple of others were sizable producers, and they produced at least three TC TCF of gas by 1970 and more beyond that. So the problem that we have in looking back at shale gas and the shale gas production, which existed maybe 100 years ago, was that it was never differentiated from conventional gas. It was just called natural gas. And so the record of that is, is poor at best. The neat thing about the Eastern Gas Shales Project is its uh, insightful design. It, it recognized that the companies going out to do this were small companies. And they, they were companies that could not support their own R&D efforts. So this was essentially a collaboration between industry and, uh, and the government. A lot of things that they wanted to try to attract, uh, attack, hydraulic fracturing of shales had not been full, properly investigated, very modest geologic understanding of shales, um, as reservoirs, no understanding of alternative st stimulation methods in shales beyond the explosive fracks. Remember, people weren't doing these hydraulic fracks in shales. They were doing them in sandstone or limestone reservoirs. No experience with horizontal drilling in shales, including fractured shales, and no idea of the reserve magnitude. That was one of the biggest issues, and we're going to see how dramatically that changed. So this project had many, many major accomplishments that underpinned some of the key technologies that we use today. And I've, I've listed a few of them, and the one that I've highlighted right here is microseismic, which allows us essentially to listen as a rock is being fracked, to triangulate locations of fractures and how high they propagate above the horizon of fracturing. And you can see the frac heights there as you go kind of across. This is from the Marcella Shale. And then the blue indicates the base of the aquifer, the base of the potable aquifer. And you can see very clearly that the fracks don't propagate anywhere close to the base of the potable aquifer. We know that these fractures don't make it up this high in the section because we can actually listen to that in the subsurface. The other piece of this was there was lots of publicly available data that, that now companies could share and use to their benefit. And that really didn't exist before. There, in fact, the BEG did a, like an ROR sort of analysis of the Eastern Gas Shales projects and the Section 29 tax credit. And the, the return on investment is, I recall, in the 100 plus percent. So deemed by even the biggest skeptics of government research as a success. All right. Now, what is the context for accelerating growth? Um, first of all, the proof of commercial viability. That came from Mitchell with their slick water frack in 1998. And again, this wasn't invented by Mitchell. It was invented by Uni Union Pacific Resources. They were using it in the Austin Chalk, I believe. And it was simply adopted by an engineer at Mitchell. And the S.H. Griffin number three well is the one that 
demonstrated this. Why, why is slick water important? Because basically it's a very simple frac fluid. It's water, it's got some friction reducers in it, it's got uh, an algicide in it, and uh, sand, and a whole lot of sand. And that is the essence of a, of a slick water frac. Now, the perception of a looming gas shortage did not go away. And that drove price from around $2 per MBTU to about $8 per MBTU. And that excludes the big spikes up to $13 and $14 per MBTU that you can see on that chart. So there you can see the, pr the nominal price increase up to there it's about $14, $12 per MBTU, but on days it was going well over that. And the second piece of evidence of how worried people were about the gas shortage was the build out of LNG regasification capacity. So there were many people who believed that was a salvation to our gas needs. We're gonna build a lot of LNG regasification plants, import LNG from overseas, and then simply distribute it from these regasification terminals. So you can see that starting in, well, not starting in 2007, it started before that, but in 2007, you can see a huge start of a huge buildup up to about 18 billion cubic feet of regasification capacity. And if you remember the first chart, we're essentially using none of it. We're, we're, we have some contractual volumes that we, we have, we're obligated to, uh, to import, but for the most part, these regasification terminals are slowly be being converted to export terminals, liquefaction terminals, because we now have so much natural gas. So, but proof positive, and, and I live this, this is one thing I got to live. I got to live many people telling me that shale gas, number one, the Barnett Shale is one of a kind, and number two, shale gas will never compete with imported LNG, and both were diametrically wrong. The other piece of this story that, that is important is that there were so many companies trying to do this. And when you're a small company and you are publicly traded, you have to reveal a lot of information. A lot of these companies were private before they became publicly traded companies. And so there was a proliferation of data and information that, that went out. And of course, these learnings, much as oil companies tried to keep data and tight and proprietary, were pretty hard to hide. So what I'm gonna show you is how individual plays, learnings from individual plays went to the next play and to the next play and accelerated the growth of those plays. So we start with um, the Barnett Shale. It took 23 years to get to a billion cubic feet of gas per day of production. Today, 2015 actually, I think that number is, produces 4.8 billion cubic feet per day. The Fayetteville Shale was the next one a few years later. Well, starting in 2005, it took four years to get to a billion cubic feet of gas per day, and it now produces about 2.5 billion cubic feet per day. The Haynesville, about a year after that, took 1.5 years to get to, 4 billion, to 1 billion cubic feet per day, and now produces about 4 billion. And the Marcellus took a little longer because of some uh, uh, infrastructure and cultural re issues. I mean, in, in the area of development, there were just flat out more people in those areas. It took three years to get to a billion cubic feet of gas per day, but this is the big shale gas play in the United States is now producing 17 billion cubic feet of gas per day. Now, shale oil was the next stage of this development. That story started in earnest in about uh, 2010, and we're gonna come back to that. What I show you here now is the buildup of shale gas through essentially today, it's about a 50 billion cubic feet of gas per day, and it's over 50, well over 50% of total US gas production. I will point out that the shale oil plays are big gas producers, and all those plays start with, a, with, with the asterisks on the right side, comprise about 36% of shale gas. That gas is simply the byproduct of shale oil production. Uh, what happened to our assessment of resources? Well, there's this group called the PGC. Every two, three years, four years maybe gets together and reassesses gas. And you can see that their last assessment in 2016 was that the US now has close to three quadrillion cubic feet of gas and over 50% of it is shale gas. Now, shale oil 
kind of building on shale gas. For the reservoir engineers here, shale oil is basically, the shale oil system is the same as the shale gas system. The shale gas system essentially operates at a point beyond the two-phase field if we look at pressure and temperature, and so all you produce is gas. Uh, in the case of shale oil, you're producing some, at some point below the critical point, and while pressure is high, you, you have flush production, you produce a lot of oil. Once you hit the bubble point, you start generating a whole lot of gas, and gas is more mobile than oil. You start producing a lot of gas in those shale oil wells, and that's why these, these uh, shale oil fields are big-time gas producers. What do these look like? Well, one of the first big ones, maybe the first big one, was um, the Bakken. And what I show here is outlined in green is the area of main production. And by comparison, I show the scale of Prudhoe Bay. So Prudhoe Bay, the biggest gi conventional giant we have in the United States, and it's tiny by comparison to the Bakken. However, I'll point out that when you look at the productive area of the Bakken, it's about 25% of the shale within the Williston Basin. This is the basin within which it occurs, which is kind of a number that you ought to think about when you think about the sweet spots within shale oil systems. I want to show you the chronology for development here, and it started in 1953 with production from the upper Bakken. By 2000, they were in the middle Bakken. By 2017, the Bakken is producing over a million barrels oil equivalent per day from 7,000 wells. So um, just a, a really, a, again, a relatively rapid development, but starting in the 50s, not any time recently. And here is the shot again, and, and just to highlight how much gas is coming out of these shale, shale oil plays. So here is shale, the 200-year revolution. Um, we can't track the volumes of gas way back when because I said they were all mixed as natural gas, but from 1825, the first shale gas well, first fracks, first commercial use, shale gas field development, uh, the first intentional horizontal well in an oil field, first hydraulic frack, first Barnett shale well, Barnett Deem commercial, and this is what we have today. And the shale oil revolution notionally starts around 2010 with, with serious development within the Bakken and then within the Eagle Fert. And then we can see there that uh, right now we're at about 5 million barrels a day of liquids, and that's about 50% of U.S. production. So what, what was the key to this? The key to this was lots of new technology. And in the modern shale gas era, I would say, or shale era in general, um, that was tied to the Eastern Gas Shale Project. So this was this government industry project. And lots of, so lots of new technology and lots of new publicly available data. Lots of companies doing this. And so a lot of in-field experimentation with, with uh, these different technologies that have brought them to the stage they are today. I'm showing this chart, which has nothing to do with, with uh, shale, but, and I've, I think most of you have seen before, this is from Bob Margolis at Enrol, and what he shows here is accumulative electrical capacity, global. The actual curve is in black, and projected from that curve are predictions made in, at different points in time, from 2002 to 2015. And what you can see is while in 2015, sorry, in 2015 we had 200, we we're producing 230 gigawatts of solar, um, all of the projections consistently were undershooting what would happen in 2015. So 2005, we're going to pr be producing 7 gigawatts of solar power by 2015. Well, we're producing uh, 303 gigawatts. And this illuminates this fundamental uh, challenge that we have as we're thinking forward with these technology intensive industries in thinking exponential progressions. And what we do every time, and I've done this exact same exercise for deep water production capacity, and it looks exactly the same, we're, we're just projecting linearly from our closest reference point, which may be yesterday. And some people might be a little more aggressive, and some people might be a little less aggressive, but I can promise you that nobody is exponential in their thinking. And then this chart illustrates another thing that I think is humorous when people talk about revolution. So here's Wood Max product, 
projection of EV share of vehicle feet, fleet by 2035. So notionally between 20 and 25% of the total vehicle fleet might be electric. That includes plug-in hybrids. And when you look at this chart, you say, well, yeah, 2025, you know, that's, that's the revolution. You know, that's where things just take off. And prior to that, you look at a kind of a low slope line. It looks like a pseudo linear trend. And you say, yeah, at that point in time, you're, if you were turning the clock back, you'd say there's not much happening. And then, you know, before that, you'd say, well, nothing's happening. But the reality is, and we'll look at the, the red piece of that curve here. And that, that's the red piece of that curve there. And it's, of course, an exponential progression. And it's simply lost in the scale, the vertical scale that you're using when you look at the revolution. Well, the revolution here starting when? Uh, I, I would say it's probably not starting in 2025. So what's next? Well, <clears throat> shale production is inefficient. Uh, what do we do when we go out and chase shale? We acquire too much acreage because we have uncertainties about the sweet spot. We drill too many wells to find the sweet spot and then demonstrate commercial flow <clears throat> and then produce. We frack in too many stages and, and the Data basically suggests that about 30% of the stages produce about 80% of the hydrocarbons. We actually prop with sand, prop open, a, a very small part, maybe less than 10% of the induced fracture. So we have typically been thinking about um, the stimulated rock value, volume as the volume that that fracture envelope identified by micro seismic would be would be creating that volume of production. Well, there's a really interesting experiment, another government industry experiment being done in the Permian Basin right now. And what they're finding is the propent occupies a very small part of that induced fracture near the well bore, as you might imagine. So we're, there, there's probably a lot of that fracture that propagates into that shale that it never gets propped and is not really contributing very much gas. And then we recover too little of the resource, well under 10% of the oil in the shale through kind of our conventional means, and then 10 to 20% of the gas. Now here is some data from Svetlana's group at, at BEG, and what they looked at here were uh, the Marcellus, the Haynesville, the Fayetteville, and the Barnett. We looked at all of them on those growth curves. And the Oil, the original gas in place is about 3.1 quadrillion cubic feet. The technically recovered resource would be notionally 780 billion cubic feet. Trillion cubic feet, sorry, trillion cubic feet. So that's about 25% of the oil, the original gas in place. So that's technically recoverable. However, the, the business with oil, with shales, is that they're going to have price thresholds that will allow more or less production. So if you're talking about a price, a prevailing price of $3 per MBTU, you're looking at probably producing 5% of the gas in place. If you're looking at $4, 10%. If you're looking at $6, probably 15% of the gas in place. So there is a huge prize that is not being captured. Why has this happened? Well, that's because manufacturing and logistics have gotten way ahead of geology, and shales are very, very complex. We've always thought of them as a pile of homogeneous black rocks, but they're anything but that. There is a relatively short interval within the Nordegg Formation in the Western Canada Basin in Canada. That's uh, about 20 meters, and you can see the variations in TOC there, which give you a sense for how variable the shale is. We didn't know until about 10 years ago, maybe a little less, maybe eight years ago, that the porosity in these organic shales was dominantly in the organic matter itself. And the reason we figured this out, the way we figured it out, was using some technology from the, from the semiconductor industry. This is an ion mill that allows us to mill with ions, ion ablation, a surface that is so smooth that we can actually recognize these nano and micro pores within the organic matter. So that organic matter porosity constitutes about 50 to 60% of the porosity within the shale. Not, it's not in the rock matrix. And this is the experiment in the Permian Basin right now that's telling us that fractures are not simple bi-wing fractures. They are incredibly complex and we really don't understand constitutive properties and rock mechanics enough to properly characterize them. And that, so that's another huge area of investigation. I want to switch to the last part of this talk, which is the business context for the start of the modern era of shale gas. And, and what I want to draw your attention to are two charts. The one on the left 
is the number of new field wildcats drilled. These would be exploration wells. That's what we call a wildcat. And on the right, we have the estimated recoverable resources of newly found fields and billions of barrels of oil equivalent. So what do we see? We see from the 60s to 70s, lots of exploration drilling. That's the, the green bar and plenty of success. And you can see that kind of 60s to 70s, we have some nice big spikes of oil and gas discovered including uh, Prudhoe Bay. What we see from 19, the, the, in the 70s is sustained drilling, but we see that would be the yellow bar, but we see distinctly diminishing success. And what's happening is the risk profile of the conventional opportunities is simply going up. You're, these are riskier and riskier opportunities to, to drill, so we're finding less, we're making less discoveries. In the 80s, we had this crazy price expectation. There was a big price spike in oil. Oil was up to about $140 a barrel with, v, with a view among many that it would go to $200 a barrel. And that drove even more drilling with even less success because what we were doing was the same thing, just drilling more wells and not having any more success than we were having before. So look at, the, look at the orange bar and you can see in the orange bar that in the 80s we haven't really improved discoveries at all. We're on a kind of declining profile with a few huge discoveries here and there. Well, between 1990 and 2000, a little after that, we had a low price environment. And what does industry typically do, do during a low price environment? They often consolidate. And this was a period of mega mergers of the company. So it was Exxon and Mobil, it was BP and Arco, it was Shell and Texaco and Shell and Texaco, it was Chevron and Texaco, and the list goes on. Well, during that period of time, all of a sudden, these newly formed merged companies had this portfolio of opportunities that they wanted to get go develop. That was the whole point, basically, of a lot of the mergers, is to bring synergies to these portfolios from individual companies. So essentially, a lot of companies stopped doing a lot of ex exploration. And you can see the big drop in number of wildcats. Um, and this really was an opening for the shale gas business. So two things happened. One of them was that there were, there were less com companies competing, certainly domestically, uh, for new opportunities. A lot of them were being chased overseas, although this includes overseas and, and domestic. And then in the mid-90s to, the, uh, to 2008, we had nat U.S. natural gas prices quadruple. So that, during that period of time, uh, Shale companies that became big shale operators like Chesapeake, like Devon, like EOG, basically saw the opening that the higher price environment gave them, and they were essentially operating in an arena that wasn't being occupied by super majors. So this is, I think, a very important part of, of how many of these smaller companies got established, and many of these smaller companies, of course, are not small companies today. They've become very significant. Now, there is a serious business challenge in, in prosecuting, in exploring for, in producing, mainly producing and developing uh, shale resources, and that is that this is a very tight resource. And what that means is that the production experience is very serious decline. So if we look at the Bakken, the big plays, if we look at the Permian, if we look at the Eagleford, we all, we all see these curves that are modeled as basically hyperbolic declines, and then people believe that in the out years they're probably more exponential than hyperbolic. But bottom line is they have that distinct shape. And so what I'm gonna show you now is a little model. Part of this I, I ran, but I extracted from um, Ernst and Young's analysis, and it takes a type curve. In this case, you can see a well that essentially declines by about 75% in year one, which would not be, which would not be unusual. And in this case, in all these cases, we're talking about uh, shale oil plays. Okay, so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna drill uh, 10 wells per month for five years, and we're gonna drill, in, in total then, we're gonna drill approximately 600 wells. Those wells, I'm assuming, are going to have $8 million, uh, in individual costs of $8 million drilled and completed and farmed in. And, and the drilling and completion and farm in now is about 60 plus percent of the cost of a, a well. 
So if you use that number, you're going to see that there's about $4.8 billion of CapEx. And I assumed OPEX over five years. That's not per well. OPEX over five years of about a third of a million dollars. And that gives you a um, CapEx plus OPEX spent within the first five-year period of about $5 billion. If we look at year one to five and assume $65 a barrel, and right now we're getting a little over 50 in the Permian Basin because of this huge uh, transportation uh, differential that exists because of infrastructure issues. But, you know, if you took Brent today, it's higher than 65. If you look at uh, actual prices, it's a WTI Midland there, well under 65. But if you assume 65, that in those first five years, the gross revenue, this is undiscounted cash flow, the gross revenue is $5.6 billion. And, and if you just do this analysis, no discounting, your break even would be about $59 a barrel. And probably $50 a barrel is a good number for, for many of these companies in terms of break even. So you produce essentially 85 million barrels of oil in the first five years. And then in these long tails, you produce another 120 million barrels. These long tails are actually very important to what we at ExxonMobil used to call AVP, actual value profit, essentially undiscounted profit. Um, and, but they're not, of course, that important with re, uh, for net, net present value purposes because you're discounting out production that is longer term. So what you, what you see happening, though, in this period of time with these companies is all the cash flow that comes from the first well essentially is reinvested in the next well. And... That creates the funds for the next well, and then it's, you know, that, that, that process goes on, and you're essentially on what people call the drilling treadmill until you've achieved some significant production in these tails that, uh, that's material. So the very high reinvestment makes these assets much more vulnerable to price declines, especially if you're relying, relying on external financing, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So my point here is, although we don't know that much about the production tails because we don't have that, we don't have the data for those, uh, they're important to the economics, important to the ultimate cash flow. So let's look at that story. If we look at free cash flow, which essentially is the cash left over after you've paid for your operations and your capex, your investments in your well, in your project. You see that, unless we, we, we'll see that for the first part, we actually had some positive free cash flow. I, I would consider this one of the more important metrics for the financial sustainability of a business. You, you see that you actually had some free cash flow during the natural gas portion of the shale story, and that's because the price of gas was very high. But once the shale oil startup occurred, you see, while you see production increasing from 0.4 to 3.6 million barrels per day, the cumulative negative free cash flow during this period was about minus $200 billion. And what companies did was they financed by increasing their debt and increasing their debt substantially. Well, 2014, 2015 came along. The Saudis, I think, really tried to uh, shut down the shale gas business in the U.S. because they realized it was taking market share. And they, there were some real adverse impacts. There were about 100 bankruptcies. Um, what happened then, of course, is bankers didn't want to lend money. And so these companies now went to equity financing, and private equity came into the story in a significant way. But during this period of time, there were big capex and opex cuts and major efficiencies that made these shale producers uh, much more viable. Now we see, you can see during that entire period of time, negative free cash flow, and we're finally at a point right now through asset sales, through consolidation, through eff continued efficiencies, um, and increased investment to a point where we're realizing what appears to be the first couple of quarters of positive cash flow. So the outlook for technology and the commercial challenge is, I think the subsequent tranches of resource beyond the sweet spot are going to be of lower quality. They're going to be harder work. And infilling that sweet spot is going to be a diminish, process of diminishing returns because you're going to start getting interference between wells and well EUR will drop. But the positives are 
improve geologic understanding, which will enhance efficiency in a big way. I think manufacturing and logistic efficiencies will increase incrementally. EOR, enhanced oil technologies, are showing some, some real promise in places like the Eagleford. And EOG is one of the companies pioneering this. And I think, and you saw that we're recovering well under 10% of the oil in that shale. There's a big prize there. And there's lots and lots and lots more shale resource to be produced outside the U.S. I would argue in the U.S. as well, quite a bit in the U.S. But Argentina, Mexico, Russia, the Middle East, North Africa have huge high-quality shale resources. So what? Well, I think while the impacts of shale resources are vast, their emergence is really part of a normal, maybe even a protracted, very protracted technology progression. And it was coupled with some really important accommodating commercial and political circumstances. Dramatic change doesn't equal revolution. I think one of the things we've learned is that adoption of new ideas is profoundly hindered by prevailing dogma. That, that was what hindered a lot of big companies from getting into this business. We have a cognitive inability to comprehend exponential change. What's ahead in a, in a technology-rich environment like this? And the context, the perceived supply and demand, prices, risk, policy, and timing matter a whole lot and mattered a lot to this business. I think government can play an important and constructive role. And I say, don't be a victim of technology amnesia or technology ignorance. Look at the technologies that are involved in your business and look at, the, look at their history because I think there's some interesting stories in there. I think Shale's on the verge of demonstrating true sustainability as in technological policy and commercial or financial. And then I think the next tranche, tranche of energy resources and we're working down the resource pyramid is just gonna be another revolution. It'll be, uh, maybe it's gonna be renewables or maybe it is renewables. Uh, methane hydrates on the fossil fuel side might be the next uh, player. That's my story. So I thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that whirlwind geology lesson and history lesson at the same time. Any questions in here? Wait for the microphone, please, or you ask a question. Okay, I'll go first. Um, so you talked a little bit about um, like infill drilling that that each well is going to recover less as they drill in these areas, but then also on the other side of it that especially in places like the Permian, they're getting better and better at recovering more than 10%. Yep. Um, so how do you see that balancing out? Do you think that ultimately we're getting better and better at recovery or that we're going to drill those to death and so our ultimate recovery per well bore is going to be less? Yeah, I, I think... And then, and then also on yeah. in the economic side, like how does that impact cost of drilling and, and the, the financial side of CapEx and operating costs and all that? Yeah, well, there's, there's a lot there. Um, I, I would say that it, as, we, as we downspace, we're going to reduce, we're going we're gonna to find less and less production per well bore, but our operating efficiencies are going to continue to increase to some degree. So, you know, we can keep up maybe with some of the loss in production through greater and greater efficiencies, but it's not an easy proposition. I think one of the things that is positive is that we're creating this massive infrastructure, is what it is, of wells within a basin. And if uh, EOR is going to be successful, you've got the launching point for that with all the wells that are already drilled. So you can start, think of, start to think about that as a much less capital intensive part of the business, and I, I think that could be very important. Um, I, I think, to, to get back to my point, shales are very heterogeneous. And one of the pieces of the story that, that I think will be very positive is that operators are going to, you know, whether it's seismic or petrophysical data or some other data, will be able to start targeting where they want to frack, where they want to drill. And that's simply going to reduce this, this sledgehammer or manufacturing approach, which I, I think to date has been kind of a, a necessity, but not a efficient way to, to prosecute the business. It's an it's expensive necessity. It's an inefficient necessity, yeah. Yeah, thank you for the really interesting insights. Um, uh, definitely going to look at your charts later on the, that looks like the debt ratios and the leveraging that's, that's going on right now in terms of trying to extract value from those tails yeah. at the end. 
Um, just kind of coming from sort of a regulatory perspective and how that can impact prices as we've seen in the past, I feel like natural gas is really kind of operating in a pretty positive regulatory environment as seen as a transitional fuel yep. or a possibility yep. of becoming a sustainable fuel. But as we've seen with what's happened to coal, depending on what carbon policies come in the future, there could be a lot more regulatory pressure on the price. And uh, you were speaking about sustainability for the future. I'm just wondering with some of the things that's going on in terms of renewables plus batteries starting yeah. to beat out the yeah. price of natural so, gas peakers. Um, big, big time. You know. I, I think that's an, an important issue. So two things. One is I'm personally not that worried about the price being regulated. I think that would be a, a step way too far for many, many people. But there are other aspects of the business that could be, and those have been to a degree, and maybe are getting undone to a degree, but methane emissions is one of those. Yeah, sorry. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's more of what I want to get okay, at. I don't think anyone's going to go back to price yeah. direct regulation. I just yeah, yeah, want more yeah. impacts the, the on other one, price. The other one's important is induced seismicity. So those are two that I think both can be worked. The, the fugitive methane emissions are, are you know, the solution is there. That's, that's pretty straightforward. The, the induced seismicity, the solution is there too, really. I mean, the, the, the areas where seismicity has been induced, ha, those areas, in retrospect, have predictable causes of in, induced seismicity. So um, that piece of the story, I think, is something that the industry is going to have to manage. And I, I think on balance, that piece, of the in, that piece of the business, the industry, has managed actually very, very well. And a lot of these are smaller companies that don't have the, you know, the governance, maybe quite the governance environmentally of a big company like ExxonMobil. The other piece of your story, though, I think is, is a really interesting one, and that is what is the impact going to be on natural gas with the build-out in renewables? And we're seeing clearly renewables cutting into natural gas for power generation. And that with batteries could get as far as reducing gas peakers. And you could get to a scenario where you don't have a lot of need for natural gas here. But this is a very developed economy. And there is a huge part of the world that isn't going to build out that way and isn't at this stage of the in energy transition to do that that are going to be dependent on natural gas. And so China is one country, and we're just seeing volumes of LNG sold to China start to skyrocket, even in spite of a 10% tariff that's being imposed by the Chinese on LNG. So you know that piece of the story, I think, is going to be more gas directed internationally, less gas consumed domestically. So those export facilities we built might be useful? Well, the, the facilities we built, most of them are import facilities, but what we're doing now is converting those because we can use some of the import infrastructure like the jetties and storage tanks for the export facility. Right. Let me, uh, let me ask a question. So imagine I'm in charge of, well, let's just say, U.S. energy policy, and you're my advisor, and they're like, oh, Richard, this technology advancement's impressive. Uh, I believe we're going to have as much gas as we ever want. Uh, but part of my constituents are worried about climate change. Yep. Uh, do we have so much gas that I can demand that no one can ever build another natural gas facility without carbon capture? And we have so much gas, and it's going to be so cheap, that that's also going to be cheap to, car to capture it. Because you've convinced me we have so much, and that we're always going to solve that technological problem. And you say, would you say, yes, Carrie, that's, that's what we should do? Well, I, I think that, you know, that, that is the ultimate solution to the consequences of combustion of fossil fuels is carbon capture. But that piece of the business is just not one that is demonstrably commercially viable. And, and you know, I, I think that th there, there is technology and there's progress being made in that arena. But then the question becomes, will renewables, for example, simply overrun that technology solution. Are renewables, at the end of the day, a simpler solution than carbon capture from fossil fuel combustion? And I don't have the answer to that. David does? Okay. Anyone no. have oh. the answer to that? Oh. He's got the, no. Hey. Thank you again. So interesting. And also the thing that strikes me is there's so much entrepreneurship. People tend to think that uh, entrepreneurship is the domain of high tech. Yeah. Right. But you see the oh. examples here. There's a whole other story and lecture on that. Big time. Um, going back a few charts, I thought I saw a peak 
uh, you were saying maybe 10% or more, but it seems like part of the story of technological advance and entrepreneurship is redefining the possible. And so whatever number you had back there, um, yeah. why, why do you think that that's really going to be the peak of, say, 10% or whatever maximum? Oh, I don't. Maximum? No, I, I, I was simply trying to characterize the state of affairs today. Okay. Oh, I, I, I think that th I, what I'm trying to illustrate here is that we're, v in spite of the fact that we've grown production by 5 billion cubic, by 5 billion barrel, million, 5 million barrels per day in terms of liquids from shale, uh, we're doing it very inefficiently and there's a huge remaining prize. So to your point, uh, you know, the prize for the entrepreneur is to look at this and say, well, if about 90% of the oil is left in the shale, I'm going to go get it. And EOG is doing this and they're experimenting with uh, essentially EOG, um, EOR processes that involve hydrocarbons like propane a as a means to sweep and dissolve oil that's, that's uh, left in this in this rock i mean when you look when you consider the kind of rock you're producing from you can imagine very tiny pores and very tiny pore throats and once you've lost a lot of the pressure in this reservoir the natural pressure that that comes from uh, early production then you're going to get diminishing quantities of liquids especially gases mobile enough to move through even that very low uh, permeability system. But I, I agree with you completely. That's, that's a huge price. So the main point is much innovation to come. Oh, much innovation to come, yeah. yeah. So this is, this is also another interesting discussion when, when I'm talking to my colleagues focused on renewables. And they're, they're pointing out the progress in renewables, which I acknowledge. I think it's impressive. It's not like this business is going to stand still and watch that happen at all. And so this is, this, is not, uh, this is not a business that is in any way, shape, or form ceased its technology evolution. I think it's, um, I think, I th my, my last statement on this was we are at the early stages of shale development and production. And so you had an interesting point, that I guess that device there that you borrowed from the computer yep, industry. Right. Do you see many more of those where inventions from other domains are now coming in yeah. and, and helping this progress and redefining what's possible? Um, the answer is yes, but I'm because we actually thought about this, but I'm, I'm at a loss to think of specifics right now. But I will say that there is a lot of technology coming over from the conventional side of the business and some of the most probably encouraging uh, technologies that we can bring over are um, applications of 3D seismic and essentially attribute analysis to define mechanical properties in rocks like, uh, like Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio directly from a seismic section and start targeting areas that we think are going to be naturally more fractured or naturally more prone to fracture. So there is a big area of growing, uh, growing research and application in terms of application of 3D seismic. Small companies, of course, were reticent to do that, but now big companies are involved in this business. Small companies simply didn't have the capital to support big 3D surveys. Big data. Yeah, big data. Big data. Big data, yes. All right. Richard, I thought that talk was awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. I've done, I've done my...